I'm here to talk to you about a research field that is very close to my heart. And uh, as you can see here, there are many words in my title. I, I, I probably won that award, the longest title. The importance of leadership in creating a culture of well-being, health and learning for sustainable competence supply management. So have you been learning at the conference? Yeah? I'm, I'm hoping, <laughs> yeah, nodding. How's the well-being? Are you getting tired a little bit? No, you have, still have energy? Great, I'm gonna try to keep up the energy levels for uh, this uh, last keynote of the conference. I'm very honored to, to get that opportunity. And uh, uh, just a few words about my background. I actually spent about 20 years researching different types of behavioral science uh, themes and, and questions in organizations. So I worked with competence supply management, I worked with leadership, managerial work, worked with uh, <coughs> workplace learning and competence development quite a lot. And more recently I've, I've come into this field of employee health and well-being. So I I'm, I'm from, come from another background as most of you, but I, I hope that I can uh, talk to you in your roles as employees and your roles as leaders and maybe we even have some managers in the room. I'm guessing some. I'm, I'm looking at you, Nader. <laughs> You're a manager. <laughs> so maybe you can also relate uh, what I'm going to talk about today to your, your own uh, working life. And I'm basing my talk on studies that we have done recently, me and my research team, and uh, I can happily say that we've been financed by the Swedish Agency for Work Environment Expertise. For some of these, we've done systematic literature reviews, looking in uh, to, to determine what links there are between leadership and well-being at work, and, and recently we studied the work environment for managers during the corona pandemic. Uh, that's still only available in Swedish, uh, but we're working on a translation, and it's going to come out very soon, I hope, to be downloadable by, by your website. Uh, and we've also had other studies financed by, by uh, other financiers here in Sweden. I'm not going to bore you with the details and go into each and every of these studies. Instead, I'm going to start by maybe you know, bashing in an, an open door here by, by just saying that I believe that learning and well-being are cru crucial components for uh, sustainable competence supply management in organizations. And I, I believe that these two concepts, learning and well-being, are, are linked. We'll see if you, if you buy that, <laughs> what I'm selling. But I think we've, we, we can establish that we've, at least in our research studies uh, and, and similar research groups around Europe and, and other places in the world, have started to, to see that these are linked together. And we talk about it in the context of competence supply management. And I'm guessing that this is maybe a, a new concept for some of you. Here in Sweden, we use the word competence for shörning, and it's been a very, very big issue in, in, uh, in many types of organizations these last years, because we have the, the digital transformation, we have the, the green transformation, we have a large need for, for competent employees to come into an organization. But as you can see here, there are many different steps involved. It's not just as simple as recruiting someone with the right competence. And we can also see that there's a shortage of competence. We can't really seem to find all of these individuals. And this has led many organizations to, to look more inside of the organization, the within process. So I, I, I define competence supply management as, as managing the process, the supply chain almost, uh, as we can say of competence in, within, and also out of an organization. And when you have an employee in place, and it's difficult to find the competence that you need for a, for a, for a new assignment, a new task, then you will need to work with the development of that individual or, or, or a team of individuals. That is why competence development and workplace learning is so important. And we also see that working with, with employee health and well-being is, is key in order to keep, to retain, these employees. Otherwise, if they are experiencing poor health and they are not feeling that the uh, employer is invest in, in investing in, in, uh, in health activities and health promo promotion, they will likely leave for a competitor. Uh, but why is workplace learning so important? If we could just 
have a closer look what we've seen in our studies. Well, we, for, for the individual, if we take a, an individual, a, a, an employee in an organization, we can see that there's a long line of benefits. These are just examples. Obviously, the development of competence, uh, becoming better at performing at the work, uh, but we also see a strengthened employability opportunities to, 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 to rise and be promoted within an organization, but that could also lead to other career opportunities outside of the organization. And we can see a link between learning and better health and well-being. And this also affects the job satisfaction and the propensity to stay, the retention of the individual. And I'm also very happy to say that we can see similar positive effects from an organizational standpoint. If we look at what the research says, we, we can see that uh, learning, in, investing in learning opportunities, learning activities can lead to increased productivity and quality, uh, reduced cost for sick leave, greater flexibility in staffing, and new ideas for developing the business, uh, what we call uh, employee-driven innovation. That's a, a concept that's coming. Uh, and we see less unwanted mo mobility. So we know that is important, but how do we do it? As a manager, as a leader, as an employee, how can we go about to create learning? And then we've tried to map up different types of learning activities. What are the most common? And as you can see here, there are three levels almost. The planned activities, partially planned, and spontaneous activities. And the planned activities, that's what, what we're doing right now. <laughs> going to a conference, maybe going to an external educational program, taking a course. That's often what many people sort of think, uh, get, get, they get the picture in their head when they, when they talk about competence development and professional development. Uh, that's something that you do outside of your regular work. Uh, but as you can see, the pyramid is trying to illustrate that that's just on, on the top. The most part of, of your learning is actually ongoing in the daily job. It's in meetings with your colleagues, it could be shadowing uh, another employee to learn the ropes uh, in a new profession, uh, observe more experienced colleagues. It could be inviting people to come to talk at a workplace meeting. It was simple things, but that's a huge part of the workplace learning. And, and looking at the bottom of the pyramid, we have the, the spontaneous activities, which facilitates informal learning. And that's learning that you even aren't even really aware of. It's happening. It's, it's happening sort of behind your back when you're solving a problem, when you're just doing your uh, regular job. Uh, and the, the problem is that we, we can't, as you see here, the, 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 the larger part is, is sort of hidden. And that's a problem, I think. And we've seen that in research also. So when we devise strategies for competence development for you guys, when your employers talk about how to sort of continue your uh, development and laying development plans. You need to look at the spontaneous and, and, and also partial planned activities and see how they can connect with the, uh, the more planned activities um, and try to institutionalize the ongoing learning so that it becomes possible to share. Otherwise, it's sort of ends, it, it stays with the individuals or maybe with the teams. But you need to document it and you need to be able to to, to, to share it with others and spread it through the organization. So what have we seen then in terms of leadership? Behaviors, leadership styles, there are many names for, for when we talk about leadership, the leadership field is, is quite large. There are millions of hits if you look at in Google Scholars databases and stuff like that. But we've seen that there are direct leadership behaviors. There's also something that's called indirect leadership. And we see that it's somehow reciprocal and a reciprocal influence process and it's situational. So these are four <coughs> Commonalities between a leadership that facilitates both learning and health and well-being. So these are, are sort of similar overall patterns. And, and starting with the situational aspect, I think that could be important. For, for many, that's a given that ne leadership needs to be adapted to different contingencies in an organization. It needs to be, you, you can't manage each and every one the, the same way. But if we look at the 
the, the more dominant leadership theories that are around, we, we, we tend to, to view leadership as a, something universalistic, something that will always function. And we're always sort of looking for the, the perfect leadership styles. But I, I'm here to say to you that we can't really see that in, in our systematic literature reviews and in our empirical work. It depends on the situation. Uh, and the other one, the influence process, well, that's also something to remember because we tend to talk about leaders and followers. But I mean, you guys aren't followers. <laughs> You're not just blindly following what the leader or a manager tells you to do, hopefully. Maybe sometimes you need to be a follower, but most often you are co-creators of work processes. You are employees, you are co-workers. Am I right? Yeah? So it's a process, that, an influence process that goes both ways. And so that's important to remember. And speaking about the direct and indirect leadership, the direct leadership that are, uh, you, you can talk, I can say that we have different leadership behaviors that are more based in conversations one-on-one -on -one, or a leader and a, and a team of individuals, the sort of direct interactions that you can have on a daily basis. That's what the employees see of their leader, of their manager. But we ha also have the indirect leaderships, and that, that is when a leader or manager is trying to influence an organization by working with culture and structures, structural issues, maybe in meetings and in places and in settings and with stakeholders that aren't really direct related to the employees. So often when you hear employees talk about their, their, their managers, they say, well, I don't even know what she's doing. She's, n she's never around. That's because she is doing indirect leadership. We can look at some of the direct uh, leadership behaviors that we've found, uh, quite a lot actually. Um, I think there are nine here, and there could potentially be even more. Uh, and we also remember that we looked uh, a lot at research that's been done during the pandemic. So some of these have been maybe more geared towards working in hybrid work and in remote work settings and, and under a lot of duress in terms of the uh, pandemic that's ongoing. Uh, but being accessible and close, that's something that's always coming up. Uh, the relational side of leadership, that's always important and something that both managers and employees are stressing. They need to have a close proximity to the manager, but it doesn't have to be uh, in physical space. So this sort of new era of remote work seems to be working quite good, actually. Uh, not for everyone. There are still individual employees that aren't really uh, too keen on this, and also there are individual managers who, who don't think that this is working fine. But on, a, on an overall scale, we can see that there are possibilities to work with closeness, even if you are at a physical distance. Communicate and disseminate information. That was especially important in, in you know, the early days of the pandemic. The world was really changing fast. We needed to know as individuals, employees, managers, what was going on. What are the latest regulations? Can we leave the house? Can we go to work? How many can we be if we would like to go to a restaurant? You know, everything. This created a, a lot of uncertainty and, and, and put a lot of, of, uh, of faith in the managers being the ones who sort of collected all the vital information and spread it in, in the organization. That's still very important, has always been important, but we see that it sort of highlighted a little bit more in research during the pandemic. <clears throat> and the third one, create trust-based relationship. Here's, this, here's something that I th see is uh, sort of growing in the, in the, in the countries in, in the Nor Nordic parts of, of, of Europe. We talk about something called trust-based management and trust-based leadership, uh, <clears throat> which sort of means that the leader or the manager is supposed to, to have a more hands-off approach and, and let the employees be more self-leading, self-driven. So that's a, a trend almost that's coming uh, increasingly, <clears throat> and that could be important for learning and health. Uh, and sort of paired with that is, is the, the next one, allow autonomy and delegate to allow the individuals that you're a manager of to actually take steps, to try on new positions, to, to get autom uh, autonomy to, to make decisions on their own. And also involve and include all the employees working with a, a participative leadership style, leadership style to involve them in decision making. Uh, <clears throat> 
We also need to be, as leaders, inspirational, motivational, uh, sort of encourage uh, the employees to really engage in all of these different types of activities that I showed you previously, to, to really investigate them. But as a manager, you also need to set boundaries, you need to control to some extent, you need to follow up and give feedback because you have the overall responsibility of your organization in the line to, to actually be accountable for your team or for your division or, or, or for your entire organization. So that, that's an aspect of, of both having autonomy and trust-based leadership, but also trying to control and follow up. I will come back to that because it creates a bit of a balancing act. Uh, and you need to be a role model. And this is something that we've seen quite clearly in both studies of leadership for learning and leadership for health and well-being. It's important that the leader doesn't forget about his, his or her own learning and his or her own health. Because the employees tend to, to look at what the leader is doing and not necessarily what the leader is saying. So if, if you as a manager, you're always the one who's working late, sending emails on weekends and at, 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 at night, Maybe you skip out on the uh, health promotion activities that's ongoing because you, you must work or something like that. Th that would send signals to the employees that it's not important. So being a role model is very important. And then as a manager, there's also an educational role. In some extents, we've seen that managers act as teachers. They are giving micro lectures. They are trying to engage in, in, in the employees in critical thinking, in meetings. They are working with pedagogical and didactical skills to actually promote learning in a very direct session uh, way. So these are the direct leadership behaviors and looking at indirect leadership, those are more difficult to pinpoint in terms of actual behaviors, but we can see that it's much about building a culture for learning and a culture for well-being. Uh, making sure that the work tasks have a high learning potential, and if they don't, then you need to be able to move around as an employee to have different types of uh, work tasks and assignments. Uh, you need to have work organizations that stimulate collaboration and inclusion. We see that team-based organizations are, are uh, uh, quite preferable in that sense. We need to have reward systems, the premier learning, Looking at the salary revision that everyone's going through, will I get the increase? Well, it needs to be related also to, to what type of learning activities that you've been engaged in. You need to have vertical and horizontal career opportunities. You need to work systematically with work environments. Uh, you need to have a balance between demands and resources. You need to have participation and inclusion, systems of feedback, and available resources for learning and health promotion. So everything. This is what the manager typically sits in meetings with, with the top management, talking about how to procure the resources for this, how to sort of build long-term cultures and structures uh, that can enable uh, these things. Uh, so I said something about the balancing act, and we've identified three balancing acts with, which are quite tricky for managers. And the, the first, uh, the, the, the one in the middle is the one that I mentioned, the the balancing act between trust and control. You need to follow up, you need to see how it's going, but the employees may feel sort of stifled by a manager trying to, to, to you know, uh, micromanage them. So, so on the one hand, you need to, but you need to do it because that's the demands from, from up top. So, so it's, it's, it's always some, some sort of balancing act for the leaders. And also the collective and the individual. We need to have situational leadership. We need to adapt and have individualized consideration and look at each individual's needs. But you can't forget about the collective, the group. You can't just have sort of solutions for, for each and one of you here. We need to, to see uh, that would take too much resources, too much time, and it would be creating senses of, of uh, injustice. So you need to have sort of a more uh, collective view also. And production and innovation, that's something we've seen <clears throat> Often coming back, uh, <laughs> where we have two logics almost in organizations. We have a production logic uh, 
doing all of the work that we are set to do. Reach all the short-term goals, report that. And it could be services, could be, could be what we are producing, could, could be giving lectures, you know, everything that's sort of part of the core operations of any organization, any business. But you're also supposed to develop the business, de develop the organization, work with innovation, and, and these you know, innovative work behaviors. But these logics tend to s sort of collide a little bit because we have more structures in place to actually follow up on the production side. That logic tends to take precedence over the innovation. So, so that's something that we really need to carve out more space in daily work for innovative work work, I think. And at the bottom we have managerial prerequisites and that's also just a reminder that a manager can't do everything on, on her own or his own. There needs to be ample resources, there needs to be groups of employees that aren't too big. I, I've talked to many managers in, in, let's say, elderly care who have 50 direct reports, 50 subordinates. And then it's quite impossible to have some sort of individualized consideration. It's important, almost impossible to you know, support them in their learning and in their health. There are too, just too many. Uh, and there could also be other research constraints that, that could sort of mess up the, the prerequisites to begin with. Uh, okay, I'm rounding off here by concluding that we need more research here. Uh, we've, we've seen that this is a field we see that the learning, leadership and, and well-being and health fields are sort of converging to some extent, but we need to know more about this in practice and, and looking at all of the, I mean, we've, we've gone through tens of thousands of abstracts over the years. There's so much quantitative studies and, and many of them are, are very good, but we need more qualitative studies using other methods and, and following in the daily work practices how these things play out. So other methods of data collection uh, to complement the more quantitative uh, large-scale studies. And also long, longitudinal work is, is sort of missing. And I'm not sure if that's a, a, a financing issue, maybe. It's difficult to get fi funding for, for your long-term uh, projects, but that's something that we need. And studies in other sectors, I'm, I'm seeing that the moderator is <laughs> slowly approaching me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we see that there's a dominance of manufacturing industries, schools, and, and healthcare, but there are a lot of other sectors that we need to look closer at. Uh, we need to have more studies in smaller organizations, for instance, in SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. They are the backbone of the economy. Uh, most companies, 98% or something like that in the European Union, are small or medium-sized, still they aren't really focused on in, in, in much of this research. And we see that the theoretical development, at least in terms of leadership, has sort of stagnated a little bit. We need to have other, coming in from other subjects, not just, you know, management. We need to have more from both behavioral sciences, from the technical sciences, and really challenging some of these conceptions that we have about leadership. I think we could come a lot further then. So that was it. Thank you for listening.